Hello and welcome to the new episode of Markets and Morality, an IA show where we explore diverging opinions within the classical liberal free market tent. My name is Adam Bartha. I'm head of international outreach here at the IA. And today, after last week episode where we ventured onto foreign lands discussing the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, we are returning to British domestic policy affairs again. Because earlier this week, the Department of Education has announced its intention to reform higher education in England and make entry requirements and financing opportunities more stringent. So today we are asking whether this is a short-sighted, penny-pinching attitude or whether it helps students and steers them in a direction that helps them to gain skills and employability later on. So in short, the question is whether classical liberals should be opposing or supporting the government's higher education reforms. And to discuss this, I'm very happy to welcome Emily Carver and Nick Cowan to the show. Emily Carver is working with us here at the Institute of Economic Affairs as head of media, who is responsible for managing and growing the IA's media output. And prior to joining the IA, Emily was working as a policy advisor to a conservative MP, so she definitely knows a thing or two about parliamentary affairs and the process of policy reforms. I'm also very happy to welcome Nick Callan to the show, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Lincoln. And Nick teaches key social science concepts, human rights, social issues, and social justice. And in his spare time, he's also advising the IE because he's sitting on the IE's academic advisory board to share his expertise with my research colleagues. And recently he has also published a book called Neoliberal Social Justice, which is a defense of commercial society on progressive grounds. A bit more about that later. Nick, Emily, it's great to have you guys both on the show. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Emily. <laughs> Great. Emily, I would love to start with you first, because you have seen the political machine from the inside. So would you mind elaborating a bit on the government's higher education reforms and share your thoughts, whether there are certain sections that classical liberals should be pretty happy about and other parts where we should be voicing our criticism and should be opposing those reforms? Yes, so I think some of the most controversial changes, at least those that have got students and um, some in the university world most annoyed or concerned about are the lowering of the repayment threshold to £25,000. So that's the salary that you have to reach in order to start paying back those student loans. They've also chosen to extend the repayment period. So you could, in theory, be paying back your student loan for 40 years, um, which is longer than it currently is. I believe it's currently 30 years, but maybe Nick can correct me on that. Um, they're also going to be, and this is one of the controversial points that a lot of people are not so impressed with, is that you could potentially be banned from a student loan if you don't get a C grade in your English and maths at GCSE. So those are the controversial changes. Now, I would argue that I believe that the aims of these proposals are sound. I think looking at things from an external perspective, I'm not in academia, um, but we currently have over half of young people going to university and it has to be paid for somehow. Um, as the government have highlighted, only a quarter of students who are now starting full-time undergraduate degrees are forecast to repay their student loans back in full. So therefore the taxpayer is taking on a huge burden, billions of pounds, um, for young people to go to university. Um, and there's also the problem that many universities are unfortunately offering quite low quality courses. And this is something that people have been concerned about for a long time. So the government is obviously listening to those concerns and wants to do something about it. Um, I think there are some problems with this and it's something that our colleague Len Shackleton has highlighted in a recent um, press release that we put out in response to these changes. Um, he argued that 
we may well be making the system more complicated rather than um, the system of student finance more complicated rather than simplifying it, which he argues is one of the key things that we need to change. We need to make things uh, more easy for students to navigate. I'd also argue that keeping student fees um, across the board equal is unfair considering the fact that some degrees, for example, those in laboratories that have lots of time, face-to-face -face time with, um, with professors and with teachers, um, uh, you know, that costs a lot more to deliver. And also there's the question of value for money for students there. I think the crackdown on Mickey Mouse degrees, which obviously has led much of the press coverage, I think that's something that a lot of people in this country have been concerned about and rightly concerned about. Um, you know, students are getting into a lot of debt. The taxpayer is being burdened by students going to do courses that may leave them in no better financial situation or no more likely to get a graduate job. Um, than they would have been had they gone straight into work out of university or pursued um, some other kind of training. So I think the government's aims are sound, um, but there may well be some uh, difficulties in implementing some of these uh, changes that they want to uh, bring in. Sure. Thanks, Emily. Nick, what, what do you think about the three positive angles that Emily has highlighted? So from a free market perspective, it seems rather reasonable to set a minimum standard for entry, which is quite meritocratic. It also seems reasonable that we want to protect taxpayers' money. Are we being too utilitarian when it comes to our views on academia, or are we missing some of the unintended consequences that these rules might impose on future students? Um, well, I, I, think, I think for a start, I should say that I, I believe Emily is correct in the basic framing of what the, um, the, the policies are suggesting. Um, what, what I would say is that um, it, it, in answer to your question, I think that the risk is that we might not be being utilitarian enough uh, regarding the, the way that we think about these things. So the way that the government tends to um, conceive of, of higher education or rather the benefits of higher education at the moment is that it's essentially a kind of private good that for some reason we subsidize in order to kind of achieve um, you know, higher productivity of individuals and higher incomes of individual people who are going on to university and then going into the workforce. Um, if that were the case, then uh, the reforms in this direction might kind of make sense. Um, but then it would actually kind of raise the question, why exactly are we subsidizing higher education at all? If it really is just a private good, it should be fairly obvious that people will know exactly what, um, uh, what, what degree paths to go down and what is good um, you know, for them will also turn out to be good for uh, the, the country. Um, but the fact is, is that higher education is a mixed good. It contains um, private good elements, it contains public good elements, and it also contains some common good elements. In other words, to some extent, um, the people who are going on to do degrees are going to be contributing to joint production of various various kinds. And it might well be the case that the kind of measuring their narrow income in the future does not actually measure what they are actually contributing. Um, so, you know, for example, some STEM subjects, you can fairly straightforwardly trace uh, the, the training uh, into uh, relatively high income jobs. But what about things like, um, you know, the arts and the humanities, especially things that produce eventually like cultural uh, goods? Um, having a kind of a society that is kind of literate and uh, creative and kind of knowledgeable of kind of the, the creative arts um, might provide a kind of useful feedback for artists and musicians and um, and, 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 other, and other people, um, uh, essentially a kind of a, a critical audience that kind of supplies the, uh, the environment that allows these goods to be created. And many of these goods then get marketed globally. So, you know, it's, it's not as if we're only all about STEM or, uh, you know, or, or engineering or like the stuff that's very easy to measure. We're, we also have a lot of, um, as we, we think of, of kind of cultural goods that sort of that the, um, you know, the United Kingdom is very famous for. And um, so, uh, given that there's all these additional things that higher education is doing, I think that um, it might be the case that uh, the government is looking for efficiencies in all the wrong places, um, that uh, there's, so many, there's so much more scope to improve um, incomes of young people um, rather than kind of tweaking. It's like, oh, who gets to go to university? Who doesn't get to go to the university from this kind of very kind of central, you know, very kind of... Um, 
a sort of blunt, you know, set of blunt instruments, um, uh, namely by improving housing in infrastructure for young people, which I know the I, I know that everyone, you know, in, in our sphere tends to put a lot of emphasis on. So what I'd say is um, that rather than tweaking the current system in this slightly mean spirited way, fix the things that are actually stopping, uh, you know, people on graduating from getting jobs, uh, you know, allow them to travel, allow them to, um, you know, rent um, it, it, you know, it, cheaply in areas with high productivity, you know, with, with in-demand jobs. And, uh, and then, then we can see what actually happens. Uh, that, that will kind of be my, my, my initial take. Um, specifically thinking about um, the, uh, you know, sort of setting this sort of blunt, you know, thing regarding, you know, maths and English GCSEs. Uh, I think in some specific circumstances, I might favour it. And that would only be if there was a very, very easy way of proving one's uh, capacity to reach a certain standard subsequently because I think anyone who thinks that you can make a judgment at the age of 16 and kind of just write people off at that point and then exclude them from this system of student loans is uh, just doesn't remember what it was like being 16 or had a very very sheltered and supportive upbringing when they were 16. We have to be a little bit more welcoming and a little bit more uh, understanding that people you know come to higher education from a um, from a number of diverse perspectives so that that particular idea I really think uh, we should we should be avoiding particularly in this in this context. Um, sure, um, just, just, sorry, just to go back for a moment about your point um, to benefit society as a whole when it comes to academia and education. Um, Emily touched on an important issue. She called it Mickey Mouse courses. So what about the courses that seemingly have um, lower economic or societal value, but some of the students are keen to study them because they are trendy or fashionable at some point? Um, should we be trusting the students on this occasion, or if there is some government subsidy involved, then does the government have a duty towards taxpayers to make sure that there is um, not just liability on the taxpayers themselves, but partially the students or universities? I, I think it's just very hard to tell which degrees ultimately turn out to be useful and which which aren't, you know, kind of prospectively. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, new degrees come into existence. Sometimes they prove not to be um, very popular, and so they are they are dropped. It's an experiment that doesn't 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 work out. Some degrees, I suppose, have superstar or rock star properties. So, in other words, some people uh, will go on them and do extremely well, and others won't do quite so well. And to some extent. Um, you know, although students should be informed about the risks regarding that, it is it is a risk that that people that that, that people may like to take. Whereas some degrees, uh, you know, are admittedly associated with um, you know with strong income and productivity gains, and students should be made aware of that as as uh, uh, as well. Emily, from your perspective, what's your reaction to this? Basically, you and I would argue under most circumstances that the government is pretty bad at predicting the future and predicting you know, what individual families and individuals should be um, determining when it comes to their own lives. Why do we think on this occasion that the government knows better what kind of skills and what kind of employability requirements there may be in the future compared to the students or their families who want to study certain courses that might seem out of ordinary nowadays? Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think we want to be very wary of government top down management and essentially what is picking winners. I think one suggestion was that um, Mickey Mouse degrees, um, maybe those who have less than 75 percent completion rates or those with less than 60 percent of levers in graduate jobs. But you could easily see how that could be manipulated. Courses could be made easier, for example, from switching to examinations to um, uh, coursework only. You can just see how these targets, like any kind of central planning target, um, will be manipulated in order to make those who uh, you know, want to manipulate them um, get to where they want to be in terms of the statistics. Um, I would just say in terms of the value of degrees. I think the pro we have a cultural problem in this country and of course it starts um, in our schools and it goes uh, it reaches back to the new labour years where there was an idea that children should go to university and that there was some kind of moral benefit in them doing so, uh, not just for the economy. And I think that skewed things quite a lot. I think 
um, speaking to teachers, there are definitely students who go on to university who probably should not be there. I think that it's important that our institute, institutions do remain elitist to some extent. You know, we have fantastic universities in this country, but we need to keep standards high. If you've got students who have not reached the past level in English and maths in GCSE, will they ever even get to A level standard? through their university degree. I do worry that we end up having such inflation that students then need to go on to get masters and then PhDs in order to reach what could have been previously just the degree level in terms of the actual um, you know, academic rigor. And of course that depends on what courses you're having. But I think a lot of people are concerned with um, the value of the degree and how you need ever more qualifications in order to achieve the same job that you may well have been able to get only years ago without that same qualification. So I think we need to stop potentially lying to children that they will benefit necessarily economically from the degrees that they're taking. They may well not. I think it's still the case that graduates do end up earning more than non-graduates, but I think that's been narrowing for a long time. So I think we need to be honest with children. I think there are lots of benefits of going to university beyond um, you know, the economic, um, getting a good job and so on. Of course there are, but I think a lot of young people go to university in order to get that piece of paper that will send a signal to their employer that they are employable. And um, I think it's I think it, it, it needs to happen in schools and families to um, for children to understand why they're going to university and what the benefits of that will be. What is your first sudden experience, Nick, on this front? Do you think that we are sending too many of our children to universities or do you think that's rather a beneficial thing that at least half the people nowadays think about university attendance and um, go on and do undergraduate courses? Well, I, I wouldn't want to put a, a number on it and I don't think the government should put a number on it either. So um, I think if there's one thing that we can kind of agree on, it's that it's, it would be useful if uh, support for higher education or should we say further education um, is, um, is broadened and made uh, you know, sort of more, more decentralized with, an, you know, with, with a plan to kind of support students um, in whatever path that they, they undertake. Um, so m my personal experience is that actually uh, I teach a number of students from a, you know, I suppose sort of non-traditional backgrounds, or should we say first generation um, uh, uh, students. And um, very often I find that it is the uh, slightly mature students um, who came in, you know, maybe in their mid twenties or occasionally even in their mid thirties who actually benefit a great deal from uh, participating in, in higher education, perhaps more so than they would if they immediately, you know, immediately on exit from, uh, from, from school. So I, I do agree that it's time that we, we rethought the kind of conveyor belt approach, which to be fair was something that uh, was sort of pushed under new labor and, and how we did end up expanding a, a higher education, but actually um, students may well benefit uh, from spending some time in the, you know, in, in, in the workforce um, or, or, or doing something else for a few years or in some cases starting a family um, and then at that point um, it, 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 making a turn towards higher education so if um, among these slightly mean-spirited mean sides of the reforms we can find a, a, a spot where in fact we've got more support and more flexible support for lifelong learning then I think that's something that we we could get behind and that could actually be um, you know a, a, a genuine win-win for everyone involved um, but I think it just goes back to this this issue that it's like it's a it's a very poor policy to cut people off from this system um, merely based on performance at, um, at, at age 16, because that's not necessarily going to be down to their, uh, you know, the student's intrinsic talent. It's, it's very often going to be about the quality of the school that they've, uh, they've ended up going to, and there is inequity in the, in the school system, uh, and also um, you know, their peers and networks and, uh, uh, and support from uh, family circumstances as, as, as well. So we really need to look at the, the situation in which students are able to succeed rather than kind of making this kind of one-off, um, rather flippant judgment about it. Sure, I think you have also talked a bit about the larger societal benefits of attending universities. So there's not just an individual benefit, but there is a benefit to society as a whole. If that argument stands, how long do you think classical liberals should be supporting some sort of subsidies or support towards uh, further education? Is it fair to say that the continent 
continental European system is better because most of those universities are free. Should we be paying or encouraging people to do a master's or PhD courses? How far does the benefit extend to a larger societal level, you think? Well, I think that rather than looking to Europe, um, it, it, somewhat controversially, I think it's worth looking to the United States um, uh, as, a, you know, because if you, if you look at where students really want to attend, uh, you know, both at the elite level, but also at the kind of entry level, um, the, the United States is actually a fantastic example of, um, you know, of, of a kind of, of an engine of, of social mobility. I'm not thinking in particular of the elite uh, colleges that are, that are not very effective and are extremely ex expensive, but rather the system of community colleges um, and uh, also the sort of systems of, uh, you know, sort of city colleges and state universities um, that um, have been enormously successful at integrating um, uh, people from very diverse backgrounds uh, in, in, that, in, in, in that country. And interestingly, it, it's because a lot of it happens uh, without that much federal support. It's actually done in a, in a very decentralized way at the state level. Um, so I think that's something to kind of look forward to. And I think moving towards a continental option would be a step back because in many ways, uh, higher education, especially before Brexit, was an example of a fantastic service exporter, um, you know, more so than any other country in, 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 in Europe, I believe. Um, and that was partly because we did have the flexibility to expand courses and offer courses um, according to some degree of market demand. Um, I think in terms of introducing market signals into the system, uh, Emily has already mentioned the issue of, I suppose, cross subsidy um, from expensive courses that to be fair, often are associated with higher incomes later on, such as medicine, uh, not actually, they, they uh, you know, uh, universities are often not able to recover costs from the formal fees that they receive from students for those courses. Um, whereas humanities and social sciences degrees, which have social benefits, um, and, and they, do, they are still associated with higher incomes, just not as much higher incomes as, as, as these other ones. Uh, the, the, we, um, you know, we can deliver those courses um, relatively cheaply. Uh, you know, the, the, the most expensive part of it is bound to be my salary, but I can assure you very, very little of the fees that uh, the students are paying uh, goes towards you know, the, my salary and those of my, my colleagues. Rather, it gets hoovered up into a very complicated system of cross subsidies that then uh, kind of supports um, subjects that are very valuable, but are not currently paying for themselves uh, because we're not allowed to uh, change prices according to the kind of uh, uh, courses uh, people are taking. So um, we should be looking at, at, at allowing um, uh, more um, uh, price variation um, uh, within, within, within higher education uh, in order to encourage universities to compete more effectively on price. Uh, that's that's important, um, and they're not very incentivized to do that as well now. But also to be able to un to ensure that um, where uh, costs are being um, felt, uh, then and also where future benefits are also going to be felt, that's where the higher fees should be um, should be laid. Sure, um, I, I love the fact that you talked a bit about the ideal high ideal higher education system, and that you compared. Europe and the US and would rather opt for a US system. I'm sure that's going to upset all the right people on the US Twitter account. <laughs> okay. um, but um, just to return for a moment to some of the domestic financial affairs of the reform. So Emily uh, mentioned before that there's some tweaking going on with the student loan system. Um, at the moment, I think the student loan system is a graduate tax and I guess the framework is going to remain as it is. But I'm also paying double digit rates on my interest rates at the moment. And uh, one of the reforms that the government has proposed is to maximize interest rates um, to the RPI, but also extend the repayment rate. So is that kind of a compromise where basically we're neither winning nor losing out? Or is that actually beneficial to some of the students who are choosing courses that are likely to lead to higher employability rates and they're going to be able to repay their student loans with lower interest interest rates quicker and they end up winning on it what is your take is that a net benefit or a net loss to future students um i'm still paying my student loan back at the moment and i think it's the interest rate that is the killer so i think i would accept this change uh, more than the status quo I think I would prefer uh, the, the proposal that they're um, recommending now. Of course, 
you know, nothing is free. If we're going to be sending upwards of 50% of young people to university, the cost has to be paid somehow. And there's no perfect way of doing this. I mean, people hark back to the times when my parents were at university and they paid nothing. But of course, then I believe less than 10% of people were going to university at that time. So it was less of a burden to the taxpayer than it would be now if they were suddenly all to be free. Um, I'm not sure myself what the best way of funding student finance would be, the best system for it. Um, at the moment, it acts as a tax on our pay slips every month. Um, it's very small. That's a very small amount um, if you're on a low salary. So I think... As fair as it can be, it does seem reasonable to me, although knowing that you may well be paying back your student loan for 40 years is a pretty depressing, is a pretty depressing, um, is a pretty depressing thought um, for most people. But you know what I find very interesting? Uh, young people are very angry. Uh, some students are very angry at the way at the amount of debt that they will accrue from going to university and from recent polling. It seems that people, young people are valuing degrees less in the way that they look at them, yet that's had no impact on people applying. So it's still very much the case that young people do believe that a university degree is going to help them, or perhaps it's a sign that they're not aware of um, different routes that they could take. It's very interesting how even though people talk about the value of a degree going down, they're still very willing to incur all that debt to then go down that line. I wonder what Nick's thoughts on that are. Well, I, I mean, what, what, I, what I would say is that if you just look at the raw numbers, you know, coming out of the Institute for Fiscal Studies at the moment, it's still a good deal. For like the vast majority of people, uh, you know, it, it might be a slightly less good deal than it was when only 10 percent of people were, were, were going. But it might be that other opportunities um, have have since reduced. So I don't think that students are being irrational uh, about about uh, selecting it. And, and I'm quite confident that even knowing what you're paying now in terms of um, uh, in terms of these uh, these loans, um, you, you probably would still personally prefer to have have gone through with the university degree um so it, it, it's th there might be a few people at the margin for whom like um better advice would be to go down a, a slightly different route and i think diversifying routes so that people can take on more vocational degrees or things that we don't necessarily call degrees but are a form of, of um you know supportive uh, further education might might well be useful but right now it still looks like it it kind of makes sense um i think it sounds like um reducing the interest rate uh, is, uh, it, it, it is, is a move in a slightly more e equitable direction. There is a problem that you've kind of got this wedge, effectively a higher income tax uh, that, that sort of, you know, at the margin is bound to discourage people from working because you've got less uh, take, take home pay. Um, my um, uh, take is that we have to look at the wider economy when looking at the, at the problem uh, there, because there are all kinds of costs that um, that young people are accruing in terms of rent, in terms of trying to get onto the property ladder, in terms of fuel costs, um, and these are all due to things uh, due to errors that um, you know have kind of compiled over the last 20, and 30, 20 or thirty years. And uh, you know you can't take out of the budget just this this one thing. The loan would be much more affordable. Um, if uh, people's incomes were higher uh, and in general taxes were relatively lower. Um, so that's, that's the sort of thing that, you'd, uh, that you want to look at. And, and the easiest way of making the tax burden uh, less, uh, you know, and the, and the loan repayment burden less serious is to, is, is to try and find a way of raising young people's incomes. And, and for that, you know, as I say, we have to look at the infrastructure and the way that people can access uh, high quality and high, and high demand jobs, uh, whatever their initial degree was. Here, here, I'm sure that there's 100% agreement between the three of us on that front. So hopefully the government is going to keep in mind at that angle as well. Um, but for now, Nick and Emily, thank you so much for the discussion. Um, the government consultation, as you know, is going to be open for a while. So I'm sure that our listeners are going to be now further encouraged to submit their views. Um, I can't promise that the government is going to take them into account if they post it underneath the YouTube video or underneath our Twitter account, but I would encourage them to do so nevertheless. And Nick, I'll have 
promised you that there will be a shout out to your amazing new book, Neoliberal Social Justice. And our audience is lucky to know that there is a 50% discount on the book until the end of February. And all you got to do is to look at Nick's Twitter account at NC0WE, um, because if you do so, you're going to have a 50% discount. Um, I'm also keen to extend a special thanks to our donors, without whom our work at the I would not be possible. If you wish to contribute and support our work, please consider subscribing to our Patreon account, where you can receive some of the exclusive content and have a sneak peek into behind the scenes as well. Um, but for now, thanks a lot for joining, and I hope to see you again in two weeks' time.